Thank you so much for joining us once again. Welcome to the Streets of Destiny Wednesday Night Bible Study Online Edition. I want to thank you for your continued support. If you would like to send in your tithe or your offering, you can do so. We're at 3444 East Van Buren Street. All of the information will be on the bottom of the screen on how to give. You can give through PayPal. You could give through Cash App. Um, but we want to give you that opportunity. We want to extend that thanks for your giving to the Street to Destiny Church. So tonight's Bible study we want to talk about is a continuation of last week's study. Last week's study was entitled Lifting Others. This week is part of the solution, Lifting Others, Part 2. Okay, so let's jump into the message. If you'll go with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, if you'll follow along with me there, I've got some things that you can write down. I believe that are noteworthy that will bless you um, with this with this content I'm about to present to you. Okay, so there's three points that I want to give to you today. The, my opening statement is this: lifting others can take on a very broad definition. So, with today's teaching, uh, we will be speaking in our set. We will be speaking in our lessons today on setting proper intentions, then giving examples of lifting others with words and with action. So we're going to be talking about uh, lifting others with words and with our actions. So if you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, my first point um, or my opening point is this, are you a help or a hindrance? Um, I want to talk about your intentions in lifting others. When we lift others, there should be a directed intention with that so that we achieve the proper outcome. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 14 says this, let all that you do be done in love. So everything that, we sh everything that we do should be done out of a heart of love. And when we, when we talk about this um, in, in lifting others, that many times we can, we can set out to lift others, but if we don't have the right intentions, um, it's going to be shown to the person that you're trying to lift, and they might resist any of your assistance. Um, we, you know, when we lift others, that it's important for us to be coming from a position of love because if it, if it comes from a position of love, um, our advice or our assistance will be taken much better. So 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14 stated that. Now, more words from the Apostle Paul. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. And I want to take this out of the scripture. It says this, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love. So bearing one another, just give, setting you up a little bit more to, to, to allow your assistance to be received in love. If it's received in love, um, you know, that, that it's going to be received better. It's going to be more beneficial to the person that you're, that you're trying to improve or you're trying to help. Um, it says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love. If we're going to be of assistance to an individual, um, we've got to be patient with them, dealing with them in gentleness and with humility, and also bearing them, bearing with them in love. So bearing with someone in love is considering their background, considering their circumstances, not making this about a competition as to, to who's holier or who responds better. When we're trying to help someone, it's, it's difficult to help someone while judging them at the same time. Our best, our best intentions are to go with love. Um, Colossians 3.17, and whatever you do in word or in deed, and that's what we're going to be talking about today is our words and our actions. So it says, whatever you do in word in, in, or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So when we see this, it's, it's a greater extension, but it also sets up the point of our message. Um, when we talk about the part, being part of the solution, um, many of you, I'm sure, have hold, heard the statement, you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. And I believe that that's true to an extent. Um, when we're part of the solution, we can take the words in, in Colossians 3.17 where he says that if it's in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So our intentions in helping someone should be to connect someone closer to the cross. If, we're, if our intentions in, in helping an individual that's unsaved, the motivation should always be their salvation. Um, and also, in, in, helping, in helping someone, 
we should be coming in the name of the Lord because that's, that's who we represent. So when we talk about helping, when we talk about being part of the solution and lifting others, I want to talk to you today about your words. So when we lift others with words, uh, big, or a word that's, that's not commonly, or that I don't commonly use, but is used in the Bible, is the word exhortation, or exhort, E-X-H-O-R-T. So that word is not a word that we use commonly, but I do want to give you the definition of that. My first point, to, or my, excuse me, my second point today is lifting others with exhortation. Word, words I'm telling you. So ex, exhort, exhort can mean to incite, by argument or advice urged strongly, one might use exhort interchangeably with the word summons, entreat, encourage, or beseech. So, those, you know, when we, when we talk about the word ex, ex, exhort, it could be changed out with the word summons. So if you receive, I summons you, or beseech, um, to beseech someone is to, to behoove them or to give them strong advice in a particular way to entreat or to encourage. So ex exhortation, it means with words to strongly encourage someone to do something. Now, I believe that we can strongly encourage someone to do something in love. So uh, one thing that we, we need to take as a side note is if you're trying to strongly encourage someone, you might be motivated, you might be uh, zealous in your, in your approach, but you must remember that all of your words should come out with love, that, that everything should be set in an intention of love uh, before you say anything. And then when you do say, when you do exhort someone, make sure that you're not yelling at them. Make sure that you're not putting them down with, in, in, your, in your words because um, that would be discouragement. So an exhortation, it's, it's there to build someone up but our words have to be crafted a certain way to where they're received the right way. So 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, I want to give you this example of exhortation. Now, ex it, we said exhortation is to strongly advise with words, to strongly encourage someone with our words. And, and a lot of times it's, it's encouraging them to do something that they're not already doing. So we wouldn't have to be strong with it if they were already doing what we're what we're, what we're exhorting them to do. So exhortation oftentimes is telling someone something. Maybe they know it, but they're just not doing it. So 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Now, when we take that statement out of just out of the, the full context of, of, of the intentions of it, um, you know, we might we, we might say like, well, well, why are these people being called to pray? Why are they why are they being called to humble themselves? Why are they why is this being said? So to give you a little context on it, it says this, or, 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 give, or give you these these notes I took after Solomon decide after Solomon dedicated the temple. The Lord appeared to him and gave him a few uh, cautions, warnings, and reassurances. The Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayers and have chosen this place for, my, for myself as my temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or, or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among you, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their lands. That's context. So the context is saying that, you know, that God's saying like, hey, if you do this, this is, this is what's going to happen to you. When we read God's word and we read it in, in, in terms of exhortation, we can take that scripture and say, you know what, it's time for me to return to prayer. It's time for me to humble myself. It's time for me to get into prayer with God and to get serious with God because as, as, as famines come in the land, as, as pestilences are, are sweep a nation, as viruses and, and pandemics sweep the world, we have a hope, and that's to turn to God in prayer and to, to humble ourselves, to seek Him and to seek Him First, so that is an example of an exhortation. An exhortation I want to take from the book of Jude, Jude chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. He says, But you, dear brothers, 
build yourselves up, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for, for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the, clo uh, even the clothing stained by the corrupt flesh. Another word of exhortation. Um, you know, in the book of Jude, he's, he's giving more of a balance. He said, show mercy to, to those who doubt, but others, you're going to have to snatch them from the fires of hell. Not literally snatching them, but with using words, we can persuade a person to turn from their ways and to turn to God. Exhortation. Why do we read the word of God? So that we can be encouraged, but, but encouraged how? through exhortation, encouraged by words. And, and the, the encouragement that comes from words can, can be very powerful because once we, know, once we know the difference between right and wrong and then we know what to do, we can, we can live out the vision that God set forth for our lives to be once, the, once we've heard it. Some, some people... Uh, they can't tell, they cannot take yelling. I grew up with being yelled at. So yelling at me, um, it doesn't bother me. And a lot of times I don't take yelling personally depending on what you're saying to me. Um, but there are some people that can't take that. So we have to deal with them in gentleness. But overall, we shouldn't stick with our style. We should work, we should work with what works best with those that we're trying to exhort. Second point of my message is this. Or excuse me, the third point of the message is this. Lifting others with actions, physical involvement. There are many times that when tragedy arises, we, you know, we get into this repetitive uh, thing and we say thoughts and prayers. And we tell people that we're going to pray for them, but do we ever actually do that? There are some times when God calls us to pray for people, but do you know that there are often times that God is going to call you to physically get involved to help someone out. Sometimes words don't have any value when someone needs your physical help. Um, so lifting others with physical action or physical involvement. Now, when I think of this, I think of Ruth and Naomi. And when I think of when we think of the story of Ruth and Naomi, uh, we can see that this is the story of, of loss because uh, the loss of a, uh, the, excuse me, the loss of Ruth's husband. He died all of a sudden. And then the love of Naomi, the mother-in-law, to show upon Ruth as if she were her blood daughter. But I want to take you to verses 16 and 17 in the story. And, and, with, and, and before, before we get to this point, there was, um, I wouldn't say it was an argument, but there was, there was some debate. And, and Ruth was saying, Ruth was, was, was trying to convince Naomi, hey, uh, I want to come with you. I want to walk with you. I want to be with you. I want to, I want to be physically involved with you. Well, Ruth kind of, you know, or excuse me, Naomi kind of rebuffed that, but we're, we're at verse 16 and 17. It says, but Ruth replied, Do, don't urge me to leave, to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go is where I will go. Where you stay is where I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be, be it ever so severely, even if death separates you and me. So what happened here? That Ruth and Naomi, they made a pact together. And they said, we're not just going to pray for each other. They said, we're going to be connected to one another. That we're going to walk together. We're going to eat together. We're going to live life together. I want to tell you this. That if we lift others, there's some people that God has put in your life that you can't just give words of exhortation to. You have to grab their hand and walk with them. You have to, you have to show them the way physically to be with them. So when we talk about these physical actions, you know, oftentimes we're, you know, when we when we talk to people and we give them that exhortation verbally. It all depends on if they're going to use the words that we give them. But when we, when we walk physically with the person, we can help them, we can give them uh, physical examples, and we can help to correct them so that they can grow 
in their walk with Christ. Ruth and Naomi, they became friends for life, and they said, hey, the only thing that's going to separate us is death. This is what true discipleship is. When we walk with someone, when we help someone along with their trouble, with their problems, and we show them the example of what Jesus would do by our physical action. So in closing, the book of Exodus talks about the story of Moses and Joshua. Joshua uh, became a fighting man or a soldier, soldier for Moses. Um, there was a battle of the Amalekites, and, and um, we're going to take up the scripture in verse, uh, chap Exodus chapter 17, verses 10 through, 10 through 13. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered him, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the mountain. Now, here's what I, want you, what I want you to know, is that the battle was promised to Israel if Moses' hands could be lifted up. But over time, what happened? Physically, our bodies get tired. Moses started to break down, and, and let's, let's, uh, let's follow this story. It says, as long as Moses' hands were held up, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he, lowered his hand, whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they, they took stones and put them under his hands and sat them there. Aaron and Hur held up his hands one on one side, one on the other side, so his hands would remain steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekites' army with a sword. So here's the final conclusion, that Moses was good. Moses was called, but Moses had to rely on others to help lift him. There are people within your life that are struggling that God wants you to step in and to offer physical help to. Well, I hope that this message has been a blessing to you. I thank you for listening. I thank you for watching. And I, and I encourage you, go back and study the scripture, um, meditate on it, and see where God can use you. Who can you lift? You know, don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. Thank you for joining me. I'll catch you next time. You have a blessed and inspired day.